everybody to Symbio Beta Live. I am your host, the founder and the CEO of Symbio Beta, John Cumbers. We'd love to know who's joining us today. So if you're just joining the town hall, please say hi into the chat to everybody and let us know who you are and where you're dialing in from. What a special time to be alive. Biology is ravaging the global economy right now. But I think we are all in agreement that biology will play a very important role in rebuilding it once that starts to happen. Joining me today is one of the founding fathers of the field of synthetic biology, James Collins. Jim, um, since the moment he created a toggle switch in E. coli, along with Tim Gardner at Boston University, he's been at the forefront of synthetic biology. And the aim of that early proof of concept was to explore the creation of purpose-built bacteria that could be used as novel therapeutics. Well, that was uh, almost 20 years ago now. Uh, and over time in both academia and industry, Jim and his colleagues have extended that kind of big picture thinking and doing as they apply synthetic biology to everything from the study of antibiotics to bacterial defense mechanisms and the emergence of resistance. And today we're going to be discussing a number of things. Of course, we'll be discussing the novel coronavirus, and Jim is involved in a huge number of projects in his lab working on that that he's going to share with us. Uh, what synthetic biology is doing well, how do we build on that, and what remains to be done in the whole field? We'll also understand Jim's vision for the future of health and medicine and industry. So I want to say a quick hi to everybody who's joining us today. I see we've got Khalid from STEM Loop. Hi, Khalid. How are you? Azira from Boston University. Peter from Montpellier in France. He's a postdoc there in Jeremy Bonnet's group. Somebody from Fort Mason, San Francisco, Carl Handelsman. Hi, Carl. Good to, uh, good to hear from you. And Alfonso Jaramillo in Warwick in the UK. And uh, Fernando Gandara in San Diego. And uh, John De Yonge in New Jersey. So huge number of people joining us. So feel free to type into the chat box. Nuha from Abu Dhabi. Somebody from New York. Carl Schmida. Hey, Carl. How are you? My co-author of What's your buyer strategy? Now, I should have it next to me to say you can buy it in all good bookstores, but, uh, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe I will uh, next week. Um, so anyway, back to the content for today. Uh, Jim is the Termier Professor of Bioengineering in the Department of Biological Engineering and Institute for Medical Engineering and Science at MIT. He is affiliated with the Broad Institute and the Wies Institute, and his research group works on everything from synthetic biology to systems biology. Jim Collins, welcome to SymbioBeta Live. John, thanks for having me, and thanks to everyone who's joining. I see so many familiar names uh, on the participant list, so welcome, everyone. Now, I, we sent over a few uh, questions ahead of time, and, uh, and one of them, I, I, I hope it made it to you. I can't remember on the edited list, but it was, can you share a story that you've never told before? I saw that question. I just looked at your question just before I signed in, and I found it a very interesting and odd question, so I'm... <laughs> I was brought up in an Irish household, and I see Eva Brennan, our CEO of Synlogics, on the list, and she can relate in that the you know, Irish culture is very much about storytelling. So I tell stories all the time. I'm not sure how many have heard this story. I expect very few, but maybe I'll hark back to part of your introduction, which is around the toggle switch, which is now over 20 years ago. So we published it in January 2000. You now, just wow, okay, 20 years ago, and the story there is that there was a gene circuit program in play at the Office of Naval Research, uh, run by Eric Eisenstadt in the late 90s. And it was largely a computational program. Tim and I came up with the idea of building a toggle switch. And we primarily came out initially computational and mathematical and made very nice strides in a short period of time. But we did not have a wet lab and we didn't have money to actually try to build it, to test to see if it would work. And I contacted Eric Eisenstadt and shared with him and said, look, we've got this. You know, what do you think? Can we get money? And, he said, sorry, I don't have any money. And I talked to Eric probably once a month for the next nine months, uh, trying to convince him that I thought this could be big, but we needed his support. To his credit, after about the ninth call, he finally gave in and said, I'm gonna give you $500,000. Uh, sent it over to us and he says, Jim, with the ONR, as many familiar, as long with DARPA, they have regular PI meetings and they were about to have a PI meeting for this program. My daughter, uh, Katie, was just about to be born, so I couldn't go, I was in the maternity with my wife and sent Tim Gardner, who was a PhD student at the time, who had a background in mechanical engineering. And of interest to the listeners, Tim went and I thought, to my knowledge, gave a good presentation. But he was uh, enthusiastically attacked by people in the audience saying that it would not work, that the toggle switch was infeasible, impracticable, that there was no way you could ever build this and get it to work. Eric called me the next day, still myself in the attorney ward, and said, 
that uh, he was impressed with Tim, but surprised he didn't have a biological background and that nobody in the room believed it could work. He thought we could get it to work, but that we really needed to buckle down and get some support. And we reached out to Charles Cantor, who was chair of my department at BU. He opened up his lab to us, basically taught us enough biotechnology that we could actually implement it. And Tim Gardner, who's absolutely brilliant, both computationally and experimentally, was able to get a functioning toggle in nine months. And I'll just do an addendum. Jeff Hasty, who was my postdoc at the time, was also in attendance heard this ranker from the audience and a few years later was invited to go to a similar meeting to present kind of early efforts in synthetic biology and shared the early work on the toggle switch and somebody in the audience chimed up and said well that's trivial of course that would work and it turned out to be one of the people who had said at the earlier meeting it couldn't work and jeff to his credit reminded that person that they had actually flipped their position that they went from being impractical to now trivial which as many on this uh, podcast can relate, is unfortunately often how it unfolds in cutting edge science. That is a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing that. And of course, that's Tim Gardner, who's now the CEO of Riffin. And we'll be talking a lot more about Riffin on uh, future Symbi Beta Live events. And also ONR, the Office of Naval Research. So that's part of the, uh, part of the Navy and uh, funds a lot of uh, basic research. Fantastic. I want to talk uh, about COVID-19. And before we get into that, I want to remind everybody that we are live and we'd love to have your Q&A. We'd love to have your questions. If you've got a question, most of you know the protocol by now, you type it into the box. And if you want to ask it live, you also raise your hand. If you want other people's questions asked, then hit the like button. The best questions float to the top and they come out of my mouth and into Jim's ears. Back again as words of magic written down uh, uh, forever in time on the internet. Um, tell us about COVID-19 and in particular, if you could, uh, I, you weren't at the Biogen conference, I know, but if you could just talk a little bit about the Biogen conference that took place in Boston. And I'm wondering, I'm not hearing much about uh, how ba it being bad in Boston, like I am in, in New York and starting to in LA. Do you think the Biogen conference kind of uh, immunized people uh, mentally, if not uh, actually uh, to, uh, or I guess it wouldn't have immunized people actually, but do you think everything kicked into gear in Boston earlier in terms of social distancing and, and worry because there was a, um, an, uh, an, an outbreak that occurred at a biotech company conference? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting uh, multi-layered set of questions. So a few comments, you know, I, I think Massachusetts numbers are growing. So we are certainly not out of the clear. The expectation is that uh, the surge is, is on its way and we expect to peak in numbers in the next week or two. My wife's a primary care physician at Mass General, so she's been on the front lines now for several weeks helping test patients and reconfigure the hospital for these increased numbers. Wow. Our very early cases in Massachusetts were directly related to the Biogen conference. Uh, in fact, I think probably of order, the great majority of, say, the first hundred were linked to that conference. I think it would be interesting to look back to see, uh, could we gain insight into how this virus is transmitted? I suspect there were a number of seeds, individuals who came in infected, that spread it rapidly uh, amongst that group. You know, did it serve to immunize the population? That's not clear at this stage. It's not clear how many uh, went out and infected others. I think the community acted fairly quickly to try to identify and contract trace those from the conference uh, who they interacted with. Uh, I suspect you had additional seeds probably coming into our universities where students were coming back from travel, some to China. Uh, and other affected parts of the world in late January, mid-January, and early February. Um, I do think Massachusetts got out ahead early for probably two major reasons. One is we have an amazing uh, medical community that I think was attuned to the challenges and the risk of this, and we're moving early, perhaps earlier than other parts of the country. And I saw uh, MIT, which is my home institution, and Harvard, which is my second institution, spring in very early, uh, both on deciding to send students home early in the semester, as well as to restrict travel of students to other activities, including uh, our athletes. So my daughter was due to go to the NCAA championships for indoor track, and MIT stopped them on the day they were supposed to go, which turned out to be a smart decision because the meet got canceled about two days later by the NCAA. Can you talk a little bit about the, the response that we've seen globally and the response that we've seen here in the U.S.? And in particular the, about the economic impact that we're seeing, um, not just from a scientific uh, and public health point of view, but also from, a, from an economic point of view. Yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist, uh, but maybe I'll speak firstly to the global response and then indirectly speak to the economics. Um, 
you know, I, I think we were caught flat-footed. I, I think many of us have been talking to leaders that, that we really should be worried about the next pandemic. So, you know, to the audience, I, you know, I, I, like many of us, regularly have federal leaders in my office, whether it's from the FBI, CIA, DOD, or other branches of the federal government, asking about synthetic biology, primarily out of positive interest, but also out of concern around engineered organisms and dangers. And I don't attempt to minimize those dangers, but to put in perspective, I regularly turn the attention to what nature has in store for us, that I'm much more worried and was worried and remain more worried about the next pandemic, uh, current pandemic and the next one, likely on virus and or maybe a resistant bacteria that will jump from an animal or uh, between humans very rapidly. I think we were caught flat-footed primarily on testing. So when I look at the current situation, what we really need are more data. We are not flying completely blind now, but the sooner we can get to more data, rapid tests, easy to perform tests that minimize the exposure to our healthcare workers, the better we'll be able to handle this. On the economic side, I think it will be interesting to involve the economists sooner than later. I think what happened here is because we were caught flat-footed, uh, the U.S. and other countries turned to health care officials uh, very early and I, I think put them in positions that probably are not fair to the health care officials and frankly are probably not appropriate for many of the decisions being made and as follows is that my wife and her colleagues are trained to save that patient in front of them and to do everything they can to save that patient no matter what the cost at all costs and it's very admirable but when you extend that to public policy, when you're not trained for public policy, there is a question of, you know, there, people use trade-offs, I don't think that's the, the right phrase, but the question is what are the best measures that can be put in place to fully address the needs? And you know, what's now happening in the medical profession is that many of our colleagues are now telling us that their patients are not calling with respiratory concerns, their patients are causing with concerns about anxiety, about depression that are largely resulting from the economic impact of them on this. So this is out of, you know, I'm way out of my lane, but I think we need to turn to more integrated thinking about how to address the crisis and how do we come out of the crisis? So what are our goals and what will be the metrics that enable us to come out? And I, I think we, we need to bring in more. And on those counts, I don't think SynBio has much to offer, but on the front end, on the testing, I think we have a lot to offer. Great, that's a good reminder that we have a show coming up. Uh, in a couple of weeks, all about the brain. We're going to be talking about the brain-computer interface, but we're also going to be talking with a human psychologist about the neuroendocrine uh, system and particularly stress hormones that are released right now. So um, it's it's unbelievable the amount of stress uh, that, that that people are under right now, uh, whether it's uh, economic or, or health stress. So uh, yeah. our hearts do go out to everybody who's uh, who's feeling stressed right now, which I know is everybody. Um, and uh, I want to again. Uh, talk about uh, a lot of meditation apps that are out there that are really helpful uh, right now. And uh, it's certainly part of my daily routine is to, uh, is to try to de-stress and also stay away from Twitter. You, you, you read that and the algorithms are designed to send you stuff that's, that's, that's kind of shocking and, and uh, you've really got to kind of limit it and, and put it down. Um, I want to talk, go back to the issue of testing. I was actually quite alarmed yesterday. I had a call with Mark Fisher Colpreet, who's the CEO of Stratios, which is a cloud a biotech uh, infrastructure company. And um, Mark used to be, I think he was the president of ALDA, which is the um, Society for, for Laboratory Diagnostics. And so I said, well, Mark, you must be seeing all of this stuff from your previous life in the diagnostics field. Uh, we're looking to do a show on diagnostics and go quite deep on that. Um, can you tell me who is responsible for the federal testing infrastructure or, or is it happening at the state level? Because I want to make sure I'm, I'm speaking to the right people. And he looked back at me. Well, he didn't look back. We we're on the phone. He, he, he said back to me, well, it's the companies that are responsible. And uh, I was quite shocked by this because I don't see that the companies have any incentive to set up a, a huge uh, testing infrastructure program. I just see them seeing it as, as a cost that they've got to bear. It seems like we should have a state and federal uh, rapid testing infrastructure, and it needs to be coordinated by the government. You know, I, I agree, and I'll, I'll make a couple comments. One is that uh, within the synthetic biology world, 
led by really innovative work by Keith Pardee, who is then a postdoc in my lab and now a professor at the University of Toronto, we developed a paper-based synthetic biology diagnostic platform, initially for antibiotic resistance, then for Ebola, now for Zika, and engaging now in related aspects to COVID-19 in the context of Sherlock Biosciences, which is, I know, part of Zimbabwe. When we first came up with this six years ago, I remember having a meeting, and I'll leave it just with a, a head of a major federal agency, and shared with the individual that I thought there was a need to build around this and related platforms to put in a national resource, a national capability to respond to the next pandemic, to have the right teams of computational bioinformaticists, design folks, synthetic biologists, technologists that could rapidly design, program, test, validate, easy to use, rapid diagnostics that could enable the test. And I argued that in the, in the off time, you could use it for influenza. We will always have seasonal influenza. And the response was dramatic and, and intriguing to me. And the person pushed back and says, we don't, we don't think that should be at the federal level or national level, that it should be handled by companies. And I then was involved in a number of companies. And to this day, I'm involved in a number of companies. And I pushed back and said, what's the business model for the company? Right. Unless you're going to be largely subsidized by the federal government. And if not, then why not set up within one of the national labs, be it whether the weapons labs or CDC or the NIH. My second point to this is that we don't have, we, we did, do not have, did not have, and do not have a federal infrastructure for the testing. So the early efforts here, there were mistakes and poor judgment, poor decisions made at the level of the CDC where they actually restricted companies who were stepping up wanting to develop tests to say, no, you can't do that. And they limited themselves to initially to one group that was too small to handle the flow. The second poor decision they made was they required most of the tests, not all the tests, to go through the CDC. And if you're now looking to do hundreds of thousands, if not more, on a daily basis, there's no way the CDC can handle that flow. To the credit of private industry, multiple groups have stepped up, including Sherlock Biosciences and their partner, Cepheid and IDT and others, to step into this gap. And it's, it's really to the credit of the community where folks have more or less stopped what they're doing and rapidly seeing can we get after needed diagnostic tests. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening at the Broad? I think Padi Sabedi um, on the MIT faculty is involved in high throughput testing. And I think, is it Deborah Hung as well at Mass General? Yeah, so the Broad where, where I'm on uh, faculty as well as institute members. So Pardis is actually Harvard faculty uh, and part of the Broad. So the Broad has made a commitment to set up a CLIA lab for testing and has repurposed part of the high throughput testing. I think is largely being led by Deb with input from Party, some input from uh, Feng Zhang, who's very familiar to folks in the audience, uh, in order to help expand capacity um, of the state. Again, of interest to folks in the audience, I'm sure most of you have followed this, that, but it's intriguing about the test that you see on cable news, here on cable news, is just a PCR test. And so it's something that many of us were running on a very regular basis, daily basis in our labs across hundreds, if not thousands of labs. And yet when you look at the early few weeks of the US, it really was limited to just a few hundred tests, a few thousand tests, which is still shocking to me. It's still the dominant test that's being used and it's what's primarily being implemented by the Broad, but though they're also exploring implementing CRISPR-based tests, the type being developed by Sherlock Biosciences. I think we have uh, a long way to go on development of many of these new tests, but unfortunately I think we actually have a decently long runway against this virus where uh, we should not be discouraged from the need of maybe requiring a few weeks or months to get the right data in place because unfortunately I think we're going to be taking on this virus for probably many seasons to come. Can you give us a summary of all the different COVID-19 projects that you're currently involved in? Boy, yeah, so you know, they're expanding by the day. Um, so, at a, you know, we'll see how I do it. So we've got a couple that are in the AI space. So just a few weeks ago, we published with Regina Barzilay an effort led by John Stokes, a brilliant postdoc in my lab, a platform that uses deep learning to discover novel antibiotics. And can you just define deep learning for, for our audience? Yeah, so deep learning is a branch of uh, machine learning, which is a, a subfield of artificial intelligence. And it's effectively a, a, a new relabeling of basically uh, artificial neural networks. And in this case, multi-layered neural networks, we have an input layer, an output layer, and then multiple um, uh, kind of intermediate layers where you'll train the system in an unsupervised manner against a large set of data. 
briefly, what we did was train a neural net against a training set of just 2,500 molecules uh, against E. coli to see which of those had antibacterial activity. We took the structural information on each of those molecules, as well as the phenotypic data, and trained a deep neural net to identify molecules that had antibacterial activity. We initially applied it to the Broad repurposing library that consisted of about 6,100 molecules and challenged the model to identify molecules that are predicted to be antibiotics. Now, this is the model is the deep neural net that are predicted to be antibiotics but don't look like existing antibiotics and have low predicted toxicity. One molecule fit those criteria, and that's a molecule we termed halicin, which turned out to have broad antibacterial activity against a, a, a range of nasty bacterial pathogens, including TB, Cinebacter baumani, and C. diff. We subsequently applied the model to a much larger chemical library of 1.5 billion molecules, looked at 107 million subset of such molecules, identified several hundred, limited to about 23, tested those, and eight of them turned out to be antibacterial. We're now applying that platform is in two manners to address COVID-19. One is that may, what may not be appreciated in many uh, on this podcast is that there are secondary bacterial infections that are highly problematic for COVID patients. So one out of seven COVID patients needing hospitalization have a secondary bacterial lung infection. 50% of the patients who die have such an infection. And so John is leading an effort in our group to apply the platform to see if we can go after basically bacterial pneumonia infections to identify narrow spectrum antibiotics to go after. Secondarily, in an effort led by Regina Barzilay and our other MIT colleague, Tommy Jacola, with input from John, is to repurpose the platform to discover novel antivirals against COVID. So the platform, this deep learning platform, is clinical indication agnostic. It's nothing specific about antibiotics outside of the phenotypic assay we use to train it and the assays to test. We're now working with multiple groups around the country and around the world to obtain data that would enable us simulate to explore a large chemical space for discovery, as well as to repurpose these deep neural nets as design engines as well, which kind of fits in the spirit of synthetic biology. And that is to use the deep neural nets that have learned molecular features associated with either antibacterial or antiviral activity to design de novo molecules that might have desired activities that could then be tested in culture and eventually animals and hopefully eventually humans. I'm pretty familiar with antibiotics in terms of the bits of the molecular machinery that they block, like some block the ribosome, some, uh, some block other parts of the central dogma. Um, I'm, I'm less familiar with antivirals. Uh, what are the big broad classes of antivirals and which bits of the virus do they block? How do they work? You know, I'm, I'm, not, an anti I'm not an antiviral guy, not a virologist, even though we've done diagnostics. This is my first foray into antivirals. And you know, they fall into multiple categories. One will be uh, molecules that will block replication of the virus. Second will be molecules that will block the entry of the virus into the cells or reduce the entry of cells. And third would be ones that would suppress the immune response or have a, a, a weakened immune response that would enable the patient to have a better outcome. Related to that, so I only touched upon the two AI efforts, we have a number of SynBio efforts uh, across our labs at the Broad, uh, MIT, and the Bees, uh, some on looking at antivirals. So we are working on a SynBio effort to develop an antiviral peptide that could be developed, delivered potentially either in aerosolized matter or via synthetic vesicles to cells of interest. We also are targeting specific regions of the virus that we have early data on related viruses that indicate you could use antisense to block replication. And of note, our insights into this space came out of a synthetic biology effort to develop a mammalian toehole switch equivalent. So Alex Green, who was co-supervised by myself and Peng Yin when he was a postdoc, at the Beeson Institute, he's now a professor at Arizona State University, came up with this toehole design. It's basically a repressed mRNA in bacterial systems that can respond to other RNA elements and express a downstream repressed uh, uh, downstream repressed gene as in response, but it's not designed to work in mammalian systems. And Evan Zhao, a new postdoc in my lab, came up with a beautiful design with input from Eric Curry and Zhao Tan, two postdocs in our lab, that exploits IROs, so different parts of uh, viral genome, and discovered you could target IROs in RNA viruses as a way to block the replication. And IROs uh, is internal ribosome entry site, is that right? Exactly, exactly. 
Um, and then further within synthetic biology, perhaps the, the, the effort we're uh, advancing and, and very rapidly is two counts on diagnostics. One is extending this paper-based platform that I mentioned earlier now to a wearable form. So efforts led by Peter Nguyen, a research scientist at the Beast, and Louis Sokson, who's a venture builder at MIT, we showed that you could extend the paper base to wearables so that you could take cell-free extracts and synthetic biology constructs and freeze dry them into various textiles, cotton, wool, nylon, and have it in a wearable form. And had envisioned this could be used by medical personnel uh, in a lab coat or on patients in Johnny's or in first responders and military personnel. But in the context of this COVID-19 outbreak, uh, Peter had the idea that it could be incorporated into face masks. And so we're now developing COVID-19 diagnostics in a face mask form, recognizing that we give off a lot of vapor. So even in the 26 minutes we've been talking, John, you and I have given off a good amount of vapor, including droplets. And the idea is you can capture over the course of an hour, two hours, three hours, a good amount of sample that could give you a colorimetric output as to whether you're infected. Jim, can you just uh, go a little bit deeper into cell-free? When, when I first heard the concept of cell-free synthetic biology, I thought it was the most stupid idea I'd ever heard of. I thought the most wonderful thing about biology is its ability to self-replicate. Why on earth would you want cell-free synthetic biology where you're taking uh, everything out of a, a, a living system um, then when I kind of scratched the surface and realized how difficult it is to engineer uh, uh, living biology, I thought cell-free was the best thing since sliced bread. So can you just describe a little bit about cell-free, uh, where it came from, and then we'll go back to this, uh, the, the, how it works in the face mask. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think it's one of the more exciting areas in synthetic biology today. And there have been great efforts uh, around the world, Mike Jewett at Northwestern, Rich Murray at Caltech, um, you've got Paul Fremont at Imperial. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave out names of fantastic colleagues, but there were efforts underway, have been efforts underway, where really the interest was could you, you know, play in the biological space without having the cellular host complexities uh, to kind of get in the way with designing circuits and synthetic gene circuits and other molecular components in ways that you'd like to see if they could function. And we were intrigued and we got into this space and that Keith Pardee, again, as postdoc in my lab, going back six years ago, was playing with around the idea that you could take cell-free extracts, so the idea you could open up a living cell, take the machinery of that cell, which would be DNA, RNA, ribosomes, other molecular machines, amino acids, ATP, et cetera, play with them in a, in a Petri dish or a test tube. It's been a, a technology used for decades in molecular biology. So for example, the RNA code was worked out by Marshall Nirenberg in cell-free extracts. Keith had the idea that you could encapsulate these and engineer liposomes or vesicles um, and incorporate engineered gene circuits with these cell-free extracts and deliver these in vivo as a way to do in vivo reprogramming uh, from a uh, stem cell engineering standpoint. I thought it was a brilliant idea. And he was playing around with this and had amazing early results, which we've yet to publish on and yet to build on because what he did, for reasons I still don't understand, was he came to me when his gym, I, I tried just taking these self free extracts in a symbiotic construct and freeze drying it onto paper. And he says, after I freeze dried, I said, okay, what happens if I rehydrate? And he showed me the results. And he showed that the transcription translation machinery remained functional subsequent to the freeze drying and could be woken back up simply with rehydration. And I basically told him, stop what you're doing on this reprogramming project. I think this could be the basis for a new generation of diagnostics could be the basis for portable molecular manufacturing, could be the basis for educational kits, like these biobit kits that Ali Wong and Jess Stark developed in the context of my lab and my Jewett's lab a few years ago. And we went running down that path. And broadly, cell-free is really now a subfield of SynBio that has remarkably young, innovative stars going in many different directions. And now go back to the face mask. And now you've got a, a face mask that a, that a frontline responder is wearing and you've got some sort of uh, cell-free system inside of there that's going to be activated by, by the water in the, in the first responder's breath, by the wearer, and then it's going to change color if it detects the virus. Is that right? That's right. That's right. You know, there are various device embodiments and then we're also exploring, can you add water um, in order to supplement the amount of vapor that's coming out? But the idea is that the, that you'll have viral particles being given off by the individual um, over the course of time, whether just from speaking, from breathing and or coughing or sneezing, 
that can be picked up by the face mask. And the face mask will then be made up of the self-free extract along with various synthetic biology sensors, Vive, to whole sensors of the type initially developed in, by Alice Green and integrated and developed by Keith Pardee, or CRISPR-based diagnostics of the type that we are working with in Sherlock Biosciences, and or other synthetic biology schemes using strand displacement that's also being developed and pioneered by Sherlock Biosciences. And we're considering now different outputs, whether it's a colorimetric change, say for example, using something as simple as LAC-C, or a fluorometric change that might need either black light or a handheld photometer. And presumably it could tell you whether the wearer has it or if it's in the environment. You know, it's an interesting, we did not consider the latter. Uh, in, in principle, it could, you know, we exposed it, your mouth. You know, there you've got to worry about capture, how much you know, is there. I think the probability that you'll be exposed in, right at that space is probably low. So we're really going to focus uh, on the former, and that is using it to identify whether the user uh, is infected. And there's good data now to indicate that, uh, it, particularly in the early days of infection, you're giving off a good number of our particles, and we are hopeful that, that our technique will be sensitive enough to give a reasonable readout. Great. As you know, Symbiobed is full of a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of investors. So I want to talk about some of the companies that you've founded and you help to advise. We do have a lot of questions that are coming in. So, excuse me, I remind people that you can upvote the questions. And uh, I see we have one from Jeff Hasty on climate change yeah. that we'll be getting to once we uh, pivot away from, uh, from healthcare and medicine. And if you want to ask your question live, uh, Jeff, I would uh, it'd be great to see you. Why don't you raise your hand and we can, uh, we can dial you in and, uh, and uh, we could uh, create a reunion right here, uh, here on Zoom. Um, so um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the companies that you've been involved in, uh, particularly Synlogic? Um, Aoife Brennan, you said, is on the line. Hi, Aoife. Um, and, uh, and Synlogic is a sponsor of Symbiobeta and a lot of the events that we do. Can you tell me a little bit about Synlogic and uh, where the inspiration for Synlogic came from and, and what the current status is? Yeah, so you know, Synlogic is really an amazing, uh, innovative company in the synthetic biology space that I think is, is really a great credit to the field and to the team that IFA has and is leading in that there are multiple clinical trials underway. So the brief story on the origin was back in May or June of 2013, Peter Barrett, who's chairman of the board at Synlogic, invited Tim Liu and myself to present to Atlas Ventures on ideas we had in synthetic biology. Tim had been one of my star students. He's a professor at MIT, now in leading Senti Biosciences. And we went in together without knowing what we were going to present. And both Tim and I presented two ideas. One is that the opportunity existed to create a pick and shovels company, kind of a platform tools company for synthetic biology, as well as there was an opportunity to engineer bacteria to serve as living diagnostics or living therapeutics. And we each presented these ideas, really also targeting infectious diseases. At the end of the meeting, Peter and his team said, look, we want to do something with you guys in synthetic biology. We don't want to do picks and shovels. We want to go after these engineered bacteria. We don't think infectious disease is the target space. So we want to do a deep dive. And we worked with them over the next year, and they brought in folks like Dean Fowl, Paul Miller. And Dean had the idea initially to go after rare genetic metabolic disorders. So the idea, could you program bacteria that could uh, basically break down toxic byproducts that are being produced in kids that lack, for example, the enzymes to break down those byproducts, so for example, in PKU. And I thought it was a brilliant idea in an area well outside my background. And Atlas was able to build the team and initially brought on Aoife as a CMO, and Aoife helped launch the early clinical trials, and now the CEO, president, is, is leading I think one of the more exciting companies in the synthetic biology space. And so the team has a couple clinical trials underway, one after PKU and one looking at using engineered bacteria to treat solid tumors. Uh, I remain you know, very hopeful. The uh, Synlogic's got a marvelous partnership with Ginkgo on looking to see how together can uh, dramatically utilize, expand the platform to go after multiple clinical indications. So the company is publicly has a partnership with uh, uh, Abvi to go after IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it means a lot to my family. My son actually has all sort of colitis. And so the idea that Synlogic under Aoife's leadership is potentially going to develop an engineered probiotic that could treat all sort of colitis is, I, I think, absolutely amazing. And the company, again, with input from Ginkgo, is now exploring multiple other spots. So it's I mean, it's a great success story. Uh, you know, and biotech has its ups and downs. I think Aoife has really kept her focus on the clinical trials and 
the patient needs and, and to a credit uh, you know, is, is advancing these trials. And I remain hopeful we'll see some positive results in uh, the coming year or two, as the company also has to deal with COVID-19, which now is going to make a challenge for every biotech in the world to actually fill clinical trials. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with Synlogic, uh, the, at least one of the, uh, the chassis is actually a form of E. coli. So most people think about E. coli giving you food poison or, or being used as a, as a biotech workhorse in the lab. This is a version called Nissl, if I remember correctly. It's a, it's a, it's a non-pathogenic E. coli. And this is the payload. Um, is it, it's the payload for a drug that's delivered in the gut, am I correct? So uh, um, much of the effort at, at Synlogic is around E. coli and missiles. So the his, history of it is that it was actually extracted from stool of a World War I soldier, modified, uh, and, and basically used and approved as a probiotic in Europe. And so, for example, in PKU, the notion is that it's been engineered to now break down the toxic byproducts of toxic output that's not being properly broken down by the patient. In the notion for IBD, it would be producing molecules that could either directly treat inflammation or control, help control the immune response. And is it Nissl being used in the other um, example that you gave, the other application as well, or is that a different host? You know, I would leave that for probably a follow-on po- podcast with, with Aoife. And we'd love to do one. Excellent. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Senti. You mentioned it earlier. Um, Tim Liu is one of the co-founders. What's Senti doing? Yeah, so Senti is another fascinating company that uh, was co-founded by Tim and myself now going back about three and a half years ago. And Tim is the CEO and president of leading the effort. And you can kind of think of it as a mammalian version of Synlogic. So Tim and team are harnessing the power of synthetic biology to develop next generation cell therapies, as well as next generation gene therapies. So for example, they've been licensed super CAR T technology that was developed by Wilson Wong, uh, Jiang Yu and myself, via collaboration that enables one to have programmable um, uh, multi-antigen presentations for CAR-T therapy. Tim is also advancing efforts around next generation gene therapy using synthetic gene circuits and is in position now to launch likely a couple clinical trials, hopefully within the next 12 months. So he's leading now from the mammalian perspective and I think is opening up possibilities for really the, the, the kind of new class of living medicines. Similar in spirit to what Eve has been doing at Synlogic, where I do think these engineered bacteria represent a new class going from small molecules to biologics to gene cell therapy to now these engineered living cells. I, I think we're gonna really serve to transform medicine in the next couple of decades. Great, and these CAR-T um, cells that you're talking about, we're also seeing a, a giant boom in antibodies. I think nine out of 10 of the, of the top drugs are antibody-based drugs. We're seeing a huge arsenal of new antibodies being created against COVID-19 or against uh, the virus SARS-CoV-2. We've been doing a lot of uh, talks with Twist and Berkeley Lights um, and uh, Jim Crow at Vanderbilt. They're all working on these as well as uh, Distributed Bio, Appsella, and many, many companies. And, and these CAR-Ts are, are also using antibodies. So they're being able to target uh, engineer your own immune cells to uh, to target specific antibodies to kill cancer cells. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, and uh, and really more so targeting antigens uh, being expressed on the surface of the cancer cells to go after. But maybe I'll take your comment on antibodies just to segue back to our diagnostic efforts in synthetic biology. As I mentioned, we had two when I talked about the wearables, the oh, base sure. embodiment. But a second effort's being led by Helena Dupieu and my group, who had trained with Lee Gerke. And she's developing a serological antibody-based test for COVID-19, which is in desperate need. And you mentioned the concern about false positives, uh, but in fact, it's false negatives. That's the worry, and in particular, the worry in the serological tests, in that many that are being developed are going to have the big challenge of cross-reactivity, and that is that the antibody that they're targeting is also present if you've been exposed to other coronaviruses. So for example, there are two coronaviruses that will commonly cause the common cold. And the worry is that people may think they're immune to COVID-19 when in fact they're not. And Helene is developing a synthetic biology approach that using multiple antibodies in a multiplex fashion that would, with much higher specificity and low cross reactivity, identify if you've been exposed and or have been infected already with SARS-CoV-2. 
So serological tests. So this is testing the blood of patients who've had it and trying to find out whether they well, whether they already had COVID nineteen. And you're saying that there's a danger that the antibodies are not specific enough, so they might pick up a, a, a regular coronavirus, which is about thirty percent of all colds, instead of COVID nineteen virus. That's right. That's right. And I think synthetic biology can help address that cross reactivity challenge. Excellent. Um, Jeff, uh, welcome to the show. You're live. Do you want to ask uh, Jim your question? Uh, sure. Hey, Jim. How's it going there? Good, Jeff. Nice to see you. I like your, your, your homage to Greece with your 1950s letter, Jeff. Well, I didn't think I was going to be online here. I, I was just going to watch you. Uh, I just woke up, to tell you the truth. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> well, Jeff, uh, maybe Jim, you just introduce yourself as well. Oh, yeah. I'm, Je I'm Jeff Hasty. I'm a professor at UC San Diego. I was one of Jim's uh, postdocs in the early days. Uh, we had a lot of fun together. Um, Jim. So there, there, are, there are undergrads today who weren't born uh, when, the, um, when the toggle switch was published. Yeah, uh, it's crazy how old we're getting. Right? <laughs> and you, you can tell, you can tell, at least, <laughs> on, my, at least on my end. Uh, so my question for Jim is, Jim, your original vision for synthetic biology, I think it's fair to say, was uh, model-driven theoretical design of gene circuits. Um, the engineering, so turning this into an engineering discipline. Now that much of biology has come to the party, uh, how do you think that the original wing is doing? What are the challenges? Uh, of course, you probably can guess that this question is motivated somewhat by my discussion yesterday with uh, the, the physicists. Um, what do you think we need to do to keep that going, given that um, it appears that a lot of the air is being sucked out of that, uh, that area of the field? Or do you think it's not, it's doing fine? What's your take on that? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So a few, few comments to start that I'll direct answers. One is Jeff was, was the postdoc in my lab at the beginning of synthetic biology and, and really was a pioneer in this space and developed a remarkably cool positive feedback single gene circuit that was experimentally tested, validated by Jeff uh, Fran Isaacs in collaboration with Jeff. So it's, you know, it's interesting to think about so-called the original vision. I'm not sure really there was much of a vision, but there was motivation when we first got in. And Jeff's right in that our initial efforts on the toggle switch came in from the modeling side. So we did analytical analysis on this nonlinear set of coupled ODEs, as well as computation, and thought about building the circuit in order to test and validate the mathematical model in the same spirit that had been conducted around neuronal networks in the 90s, which was really one of the real first efforts where modeling was closely integrated with experiments. Similar spirit was exemplified by Michael Illowitz's work on the repressilator. I think very much that that was, the experimental work was driven by Michael's analysis and computation. When you look at then the early days of synthetic biology, for the first two to three years, most of the publications were around computation and analysis because many of us did not have wet labs and or we were just getting wet labs set up and we were kind of mystic toys coming in from physics, computer science, engineering and not schooled in molecular biology. Then experimental labs began to take off and the modeling took a backseat. And if anything, you saw people still trying to work under the banner of integrated computational experimental work, but in most cases, the computation came in after the fact as window dressing. Uh, really more to just kind of match the data versus to drive the experiments. I think, uh, to Jeff's point, I think it's an exciting time to get back to modeling as a fundamental important tool to help guide design as well as to gain mechanistic fundamental insight into natural systems. And I think we need to do a better job of integrating ourselves and crossing the cultural divide from more traditional basic biology labs. One, two, I think we need to be in there to ask the right questions. So I think in the end of the day, the models need to be driven by biological data and they need to address a biological question. So I think back to the 90s when I was an early professor at MIT and as Jeff joined, he and I used to love to go to Gordon Conference and sorts, including the theoretical biology group, which had been very active in a marvelous community from the late 60s on. But most of my colleagues, they were primarily driven by the model. The model was the end, was the goal. And if we're to have the impact in biology that I think we can as a field, you need to have the biology as the end, the biology is the goal. And so Jeff, I think it's a great opportunity, a great time as we see 
next generation computational and analytical tools such as machine learning, deep learning coming to play that will expand our ability to better design and engineer biology, which I still think we're at the very early stages of this field. Great, thank you. Thanks for joining us, Jeff, appreciate it. Khaled, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and talk about uh, STEM Loop for a second and then uh, ask your question? Hi, John uh, and Jim. Um, yeah, so my name is Khaled. I'm uh, the co-founder of STEM Loop. I'm also um, at Northwestern University Center for Synthetic Biology, where we've had some projects with Jim Collins. So my question to Jim was um, whether or not we're going to see a pandemic of this scale caused by antimicrobial resistance. And if so, what does that look like? How does that scenario play out? And how can we um, you know, develop technologies to prevent that from happening? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, you know who, who knows wh where the next pandemic is coming from and what it's, need, what it's likely going to be. You know, I think when you look at the, at the back uh, in history on pandemics, they typically turn to be respiratory. Uh, illnesses that get transmitted uh, in the air, and this one present included. So would one have a, a resistant antibacteria uh, bacteria? Unlikely, but not out of the question is zero. So you can envision having maybe a resistant one that's pneumococcal uh, that gets, gets, gets spread. So let's put it as non-zero, but low probability. Given how do we address the non-zero, you know, I think, I think we need to dramatically expand our approaches, including from a synthetic biology standpoint. So John made allusions earlier in the podcast to the targets of antibiotics, and I've maintained that I think we've got a pretty good handle on what they target, but I, my lab's been working for over a decade. I still don't think we've got a good understanding of how they actually kill the bacteria. And we have a limited understanding of then also how the bugs evolve to evade these uh, chemotherapy agents. So we need to use Sinbao to better understand how they act. And then we, I think, need to use Sinbao to come up with clever means to go after them. So whether it's engineering bacteriophage, so viruses that specifically go after bacteria, or engineering, uh, novel antimicrobial peptides or engineering a peptide that could evolve with resistance are possibilities that could become exciting. Maybe I'll just pick up the education theme briefly because I think it's an important topic. Uh, you know, this is horrible. Uh, the, the situation we're in, a positive that could come out of this is I think it could really serve to inspire the young people out there to take up infectious disease and the related areas, including synthetic biology. So at MIT, the young hotshots that come in wanting to study life sciences want to do predominantly either cancer research or neuroscience. Two areas of great excitement, two areas that we glancingly touch upon in my lab. We at MIT, of course, see a, a, a decent number wanting to do synthetic biology. But we desperately need the young brainiacs, the young geniuses around the world to get motivated to address infectious diseases. As we see, it's one of the existential problems that are facing us. And we need the talent to come in. And I'm hopeful that this will be a, a real a positive outcome, that we'll get more and more folks to see that these are tractable problems, exciting challenges, and, and truly uh, timely and needed to be addressed. Great answer. Thank you, Khaled. Uh, Gaurav, would you like to ask your question live? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I'm actually a student at Georgia Tech, formerly iGEM, and I used to work on to hold switches in the context of cholera diagnostics. And so my question was, um, do you have any efforts in your lab expanding uh, towards the usage of toehold switches in mammalian cells? And uh, just define what uh, toehold switch for us uh, is for us, Jim, please. Sure, so you know, th these are the switches I mentioned earlier. They were initially developed by uh, Alex Green and, and Alex developed them. So what they are are pressed mRNA structures. So Alex designed them so that you'd have an mRNA element expressed by bacteria where he could engineer them to have a stem loop structure where in the loop you'd have the ribosome binding site sequestered and you'd have a stem structure with say sequence a and b that would keep the ribosome binding site out there and prevent the ribosome from docking and expressing the protein encoded by the gene the idea was then the stem loop structure could be designed of sequence a and b to respond to a star b star that would be an element initially that could be an mrna expressed by that bacterium so if that Alex's initial design, which is to set it up as a basis for a living microarray that could report on X number of genes being expressed in bacteria. And he did a brilliant job in multiple efforts on that. In collaboration with Keith, we recognize you could use it as a diagnostic component that could be incorporated into paper or in cloth or in plastic 
and is some of the founding technology for efforts that came out of our lab. You know, Gaurav's question is an interesting one. We've been challenged by a number of groups here, you know, could you extend it into mammalian cells or you could extend it broadly into eukaryotes, including plants? And the current design did not lend itself well there. It really lent itself to bacterial design. But I, I mentioned earlier this project in my lab led by Evan Zhao with input from Eric Curry, Angela Mao, and Zhao Tan has now modified the design to function in mammalian cells, including human cells. So we now have an RNA control element that will respond to other RNA inputs that will express a gene that's being controlled by it. And we think this serves as a potential new, easy to program control element for human cells and other eukaryotic systems that could be both an internal sensor element as well as one that gives you an additional control knob that you can now have this respond to uh, tissue specific factors. So we were planning to finish that off um, probably by about now, but we got obviously uh, redirected by the COVID-19 outbreak over the last few weeks, but we'll soon have a story to present to the community. Fantastic, thank you, thank you, Gaurav. I have a question for you, Jim. I asked this question to you about 10 years ago when, uh, when I was a graduate student and you came to visit, and the question was, what tool do you wish you had that you don't? And you, the answer that you gave me was a ability to edit DNA in living cells. And of course, then a couple of years after that, um, CRISPR was discovered. And now we have a lot of tools, a lot, a lot of different uh, Cas enzymes for, um, for being able to do just that. Um, I'd like to ask the same question again. What tool now do you wish you had that you don't? Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I've, I've thought about this. I think there are multiple, but maybe I'll, I'll speak to one um, that would be at a very high level abstract. Um, I, I, was at, I had a chance to speak at the MIT CEO Council uh, probably about a year and a half ago about synthetic biology. And Eric Schmidt, who was then just coming off as being a leader at Google, was in the audience and asked me the same question. And I told him, I said, Eric, what we really could use would be probes, equivalent to analyze in real time what was happening in our cells, both looking at input and output at uh, points in the circuits and pathways that we were designing. In similar spirit to what electrical engineers have. So as all of us have taken in our circuits class, you, know, you go in your lab and you can stick your probe on one part, from another part and measure some characteristic. We to this day don't have anything really along those lines. Um, and it would enable us to more rapidly spec out what's happening. In cells. And I, obviously, I'm saying this at a high level to give us readout. And it was interesting. Eric came up to me afterwards and said, oh, Jim, everybody must be working on that. I said, Eric, I actually don't think anybody's working on that. And, and he was pushed on. I said, you know, for the most part, we tend to develop smaller scale tools and focus on our small scale proof of principle versus kind of thinking on a larger scale on what's needed. And I do think these kind of readouts would be critically important to speak to Jeff Hastie's uh, mission, and it was on the line kind of his question, which is we need to expand our data sets so that we can take advantage of the power of things like machine learning and deep learning that will enable us to infer design principles, will enable us to find more parts in nature to really help drive our field forward. And I think we're limited in both cases right now. We really, it's really hard to engineer biology. It, you know, biology is not an engineering discipline and synthetic biology is still so early that we don't have those principles and we're still limiting ourselves largely to just a few dozen parts that were around in the in the first decade. That really, we didn't spend too much time in this last decade expanding. And so these types of tools to generate the data that will allow us to then expand our capabilities are what's critically needed, in my view. Great, thank you. Uh, Ravi, joining us from India in uh, Bangalore, I believe. I was actually with Ravi in January in Mumbai. Um, Welcome to the show. Uh, if you uh, want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question live. And uh, also, if you could uh, give us a status update of uh, how things are looking in India right now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, John. Hi, hi Jim. Um, so, uh, yeah, India is, is doing, is under a lockdown for the past, I mean, it's a 21 day lockdown. We have crossed, crossed like 10 days. So a lot of good actions that have been taken by the government. Uh, not enough testing that is the uh, are being done naturally, but then the, the mortality rates uh, have been very low in India so far. I've also been talking to many hospital systems around, so there's not been like many like swarm of people getting admitted with severe complications or anything like that. 
So we do have a very low mortality rate as well as the infectivity is not very high. Uh, maybe because of the temperature, maybe because of other factors. Uh, I mean, not, not, uh, studies need to be done, but then a lot of Indians do carry a Latin TB infection. So whether that plays a role, uh, I mean, all these are open questions at this point, I think. Yes, right. hope, hope the impact is not so high. Yeah. Okay, uh, keeping it short. Yeah. And we were just, uh, j just to plug uh, one of our another sponsors, uh, Reliance Industries. We were hosted by Reliance in January, and I actually had a call with uh, with Reliance earlier this week, and and they've built a, a, a brand new hospital in Mumbai just to deal with COVID nineteen. So some really good work that we're seeing uh, right. from from our whole community in India. So go ahead and ask your question, Ravi. Yeah, hi, uh, Jim. A lot of great work. So my question is, uh, when would we have a universal like environmental monitoring and surveillance uh, for pathogens? Would we have any time soon from all the excellent synthetic biology tools that are being developed? That's one thing. On, on, a, on a related note, you did mention about AI as well as deep learning. Uh, I mean, it would be great if there's any chance of collaboration from, from around this part. Could, could you repeat the last end, the last part of that question on the deep learning? I mean, it, are the, it would be great if there would be any chance of collaboration from this part of the world. Ah, yes. So a, a couple points. Uh, so firstly, I, I think that our community, synthetic biology, has offered some pretty impressive tools and platforms around diagnostics and really for universal diagnostic, albeit within the academic setting. So be they Toho sensors, other efforts, uh, Andy, Andy Ellington, our great friend and colleague at UT Austin, has uh, related nucleic acid. Since it's developed, you've got a broad range of CRISPR components that our lab, Jennifer Duadna, uh, Party Sabeti, and others have developed. So I think from a nucleic acid standpoint, we have the tools in place that would enable us to have a universal testing and surveillance system that nonetheless needs to be productized and coupled right to the device elements. Um, and, and we're not there yet. We have, I think, the capability, but there needs to be effort to integrate. And then right now, everybody's running around trying to get the right data in place in order to get FDA approval to move it out. I think as the current crisis first wave subsides, I think you'll see bigger efforts to integrate and put in place platforms that could truly be universal, meaning across the globe. Your second point on deep learning, machine learning, I think represents a remarkable opportunity for many around the world, but in particular in India. You know, as you know, you know, India has really helped lead the industrial, the, the, the IT revolution for putting out some of the, the world's best software engineers at a remarkably high level and brilliant through the IT system and sorts. And it's really a story yet to be fully told of the positive impact in Silicon Valley and around the world. I think there's a similar opportunity as India now is ramping up significant interest in biotech beyond pharmaceutical development from a CRO standpoint but embracing synthetic biology is what's gonna be one of the defining technologies of this decade. And my money's on India is playing a big role. And so for example, I'm now on the science advisory board for Ashoka University, which just put in a new life science institute that's going to focus on synthetic biology. And I think tapping into the young there of seeing how computation coupled with data can really make a difference in this field and related biotech and basic science fields I hope will serve to really motivate young people to move into the field. Great. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Um, Jim, how do you think COVID-19 is going to reshape our relationship, trust, and participation in things like government, global institutions, and in generally engagement with science and scientists and the scientific method? You know, I, I, I think it's going to be a very positive engagement all around. Uh, I, I think it's going to give an appreciation for folks of what constitutes science, what constitutes an established fact or result. I think it'll record people recognize the, the power and the limitations of models, what goes in, what are assumptions, what matters, what really constitutes a proper clinical trial. I think what you're seeing right now uh, as a positive, which is horrible that we hear, but the, you know, the celebration of our healthcare workers, the celebration of scientists that you, know, you don't have athletes on TV right now. You've got healthcare workers, you've got scientists on TV, and TV's a powerful medium to point to how valuable these works are. And so instead of carrying that young person from wherever they are in the world to be the professional athlete or the rock star to think about being a healthcare worker or maybe a synthetic biologist, I think will be a tremendously positive outcome. I think you're seeing the scientific community around the globe come together, people putting aside competition, putting aside differences, putting aside IP concerns and just coming together to figure out how do we address this. And I think there's going to be lasting positive value from that. 
you know, there's criticisms of government responses and, you know, it's always healthy in open societies to say what you don't like. But I also see and hope that people see that people are doing what they can, maybe making some bad decisions and making mistakes as we all do. But I also hope we'll see a greater trust and an increased expansion of private-public partnerships because we're seeing that there, there are areas of our society, public goods that have been neglected. You know, diagnostics for pandemics was a public good that wasn't being addressed. And I think we're now seeing that we need to address these and related schemes to get ready for what's going to be the next pandemic. You know, years ago, I was, even a few months ago, next pandemic's coming, don't know where, don't know from when. We're in our current one, and unfortunately the next one's coming. We don't know from where, we don't know when, but it's coming and we need to do a better job of being prepared. And you know, scientists and relationships with our leaders are gonna be fundamental for being that, prepared for that next one. So we'll take one more question from Isaac Larkin and then I have a final question. Uh, Isaac, go ahead. Hi, Jim. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at Northwestern um, and I'm also uh, a board member with Khalid uh, on a community bio group in Chicago. And my question is about you know, what, I, I know that the self-read, the paper-based diagnostics uh, have great potential for distributed use, but um, what is preventing the democratized production, like the low-cost production of these self-read extracts in lower resource settings, like a community lab or like a garage? Um, yeah, but what are, what are the time and cost and skill limiting factors for just making self-read extracts and making them stable? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, Isaac. So I guess I can answer in a couple ways. One is I, I don't think there's any limit from, say, a, a, a citizen lab or, uh, uh, say, a community resource of, of looking to build these and use these to run experiments and test. And Mike Jewett, who I'm sure you, you know very well in Northwestern, has protocols on how you can uh, obtain those from uh, bacteria, the self free and or how to have homebrew. And there are various efforts around the country, related ones coming out of different universities and schemes. I guess if you go to the next level of what's holding it back from say implementing it to address COVID-19 of either running a test or developing a device that could be used is really quality control. In that you want to make sure that uh, what you make functions uh, at a high quality so it needs to be produced, tested, produced, manufactured in a high quality setting. And frankly, my lab won't meet those standards typically, and certainly a community lab or somebody's basement or garage won't meet those standards. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't contribute to gain insight, but the standards that are needed in order to either run it as a testing facility or make something that could be run is much higher than what we normally would be able to put in the lab. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, the final question I want to ask, and, and we've touched on this a little bit, but are there any other positives? And I want to end on a positive note. Anything else that you think will come from COVID-19 in terms of um, changes to society? Uh, I don't know if you've seen the meme, we're not going back to normal uh, because normal wasn't very good anyway. So what are, some of the, uh, what are some of the positives that you think will come out of this? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I, I haven't thought too much about it, but I'll maybe say a couple of things real quick. You know, I, I think... You know, oddly being at home in sorts that many of us have now reconnected in very positive ways with friends, with family and colleagues in, in ways we haven't. And maybe to go to an early comment you made, John, I don't know whether it was prepped for this or before we turned on or at the beginning, but I, I think people have turned to too much online, be it in social media uh, or other platforms, that I think we need to disconnect from that and reconnect in person with folks, whether it be a Zoom or on discussion. I think we need to also kind of deep disconnect and use our brains, both read more extensively, think more extensively, reflect more extensively, and think about what matters to you, both personally and professionally, and go all in and commit. And don't get caught up in how many clicks you have or how many followers you have, but can you come up with a good idea that you can execute on? And so I think it's helping to reground many of us that I think we got caught up in superficiality. And I think as scientists, it's a matter, can you come up with a good idea? Can you execute on that idea to see if it's good? If it's not, and can you go the next step? And oddly, even though many of us are disconnected from our lab, or at least partly removed, I think it's serving to give us new direction and a new purpose. And I hope we come out of this as a stronger, more focused community that is more substantive and less after this superficiality. 
Great answer. Thank you. We've come to the end of the hour. Uh, it's just the last thing I can do to thank Jim Collins for joining us, taking time out of his busy schedule, out of all these interesting COVID-19 projects that he's leading and people in his lab are working on. So Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, John. And thanks to everyone who, who joined this podcast. And we didn't get to all the questions, but we will be sending them on to Jim. And uh, if you have a, a digital round of applause that you want to give for Jim in the, uh, in the chat, then please do that. And any comments, we'll be happy to pass on to him. So next week, we have on Monday, Drew Endy, who will be joining us. And on Thursday, very special guest is the chief medical officer from Illumina, who's going to be joining us. And we're going to be talking all about the sequencing and what we can work on together in terms of uh, pandemic sequencing and pandemic preparedness using uh, sequencing. So all, in, all about reading DNA will be next week. And uh, before everybody leaves, I just would like to ask you folks a question. We're thinking about the format for this topic, uh, for, this, uh, for this series of Symbi Beta Lives. We want to know who you would like to speak to, who you would like us to have on as a guest. And we're also thinking about the format and the timing of the format. So far, we're doing these at 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, Tuesday through Friday, most weeks. Um, would you prefer that we condense them down into, let's say, a Wednesday session when the newsletter comes out? We actually do maybe a longer session that lasts for two or three hours, and we have multiple guests dropping in and out of the session, and we cover more topics and we cover the week's news. Or do you think it's better to do a deep dive on individual people um, like we did today? So I'd love to get your feedback, how you're enjoying these, what you like, what you don't dislike. Uh, sorry, what you like, what you don't like, and, uh, and uh, any feedback that you've got, we'd love to hear it. That's it for today. So thank you again. We'll